Section 13 of Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Letters of Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi from Italy and Switzerland. Translated by Grace Wallace. Music provided by Project Gutenberg. June 6th and June 16th, 1831. Rome, June 6th. 1831. My dear parents, it is indeed high time that I should write to you a rational, methodical letter, for I fear that none of those from Naples were worth much. It really seemed as if the atmosphere there deterred every one from serious reflection. At least I very seldom succeeded in collecting my thoughts or ideas, and now I have been scarcely more than a few hours here, when I once more resume that Roman tranquillity and grave serenity which I alluded to in my former letters from this place. I cannot express how infinitely better I love Rome than Naples. The people allege that Rome is monotonous, one uniform hue, melancholy, and solitary. It is certainly true that Naples is more like a great Roman city, more lively and varied, and more cosmopolitan. I dislike it, just as I dislike many-sidedness, which, moreover, I rather think I do not much believe in. Anything that aspires to be distinguished, or beautiful, or really great, must be one-sided. But then this one side must be brought to a state of the most consummate perfection, and no man can deny that such is the case at Rome. Naples seems to me too small to be called properly a great city. All the life and bustle are confined to two large thoroughfares, the Toldeo and the coast from the harbour to the Chiaia. Naples does not realise to my mind the idea of a centre for a great nation which london offers in such perfection chiefly indeed because it is deficient in a people for the fishermen and lazzaroni i cannot designate as a people they are more like savages and their centre is not naples but the sea the middle classes by which i mean those who pursue various trades and the working citizens who form the basis of other great towns are quite subordinate indeed i may almost say that such a class is not to be found there it was this that often made me feel out of humour during my stay in naples much as i loved and enjoyed the scenery but as a dissatisfied feeling constantly recurred i think i at last discovered the cause to lie within myself i cannot say that i was precisely unwell during the incessant sirocho but it was more disagreeable than an indisposition which passes away in a few days i felt languid disinclined for all that was serious in fact lazy I lounged about the streets all day with a morose face, and would have preferred lying on the ground, without the trouble of thinking, or wishing, or doing anything. Then it suddenly occurred to me, that the principal classes of Naples live in reality precisely in the same manner, that consequently the source of my depression did not spring from myself, as I had feared, but from the whole combination of air, climate, etc. The atmosphere is suitable for grandees, who rise late and never require to go out on foot, never think, for this is heating, sleep away a couple of hours on a sofa in the afternoon, then eat ice, and drive on to the theatre at night, where again they do not find anything to think about, but simply make and receive visits. On the other hand, the climate is equally suitable for a fellow in a shirt, with naked legs and arms, who also has no occasion to move about, begging for a few grani, when he has literally nothing left to live on taking his afternoon siesta stretched on the ground or on the quay or on the stone pavement the pedestrians step over him or shove him aside if he lies right in the middle he fetches his frutti di mare himself out of the sea and sleeps wherever he may chance to find himself at night in short he employs every moment in doing exactly what he likes best just as an animal does these are the two principal classes of naples by far the largest portion of the population from the Toledo there, consists of the gaily dressed ladies and gentlemen, or husbands and wives driving together in handsome equipages, or those olive sans culotte, who sometimes carry about fish for sale, brawling in the most stentorian way, or bearing burdens when they have no longer any money left. I believe there are few indeed who have any settled occupation, or follow up any pursuit with zeal and perseverance, or who like work for the sake of working. Goethe says that the misfortune of the North is that people there always wish to be doing something, and striving after some end, 
and he goes on to say that an italian was right who advised him not to think so much for it would only give him a headache i suppose however that he was merely jesting at all events he did not act in this manner himself but on the contrary like a genuine northman if however he means that the difference of the character is produced by nature and subservient to her influence then there is no doubt that he is quite in the right i can perfectly conceive that it must be so and why wolves howl still it is not necessary to howl along with them the proverb should be exactly reversed those who owing to their position are obliged to work and must consequently both think and bestir themselves treat the matter like a necessary evil which brings them in money and when they actually have it they too live like the great or naked gentlemen thus there is no shop where you are not cheated natives of naples who have been customers for many years are obliged to bargain and to be as much on their guard as foreigners and one of my acquaintances who had dealt at the same shop for fifteen years told me that during the whole of that period there had been invariably the same battle about a few scudi and that nothing could prevent it thus it is there that there is so little industry or competition and that donizetti finishes an opera in ten days to be sure it is sometimes hissed but that does not matter for it is paid for all the same and he can then go about amusing himself if at last however his reputation becomes endangered he will in that case be forced really to work which he would find by no means agreeable this is why he sometimes writes an opera in three weeks bestowing considerable pains on a couple of airs in it so that they may please the public and then he can afford once more to divert himself and once more to write trash their painters in the same way paint the most incredibly bad pictures far inferior even to their music their architects also erect buildings in the worst taste among others an imitation on small scale of st peter's in the chinese style but what does it matter the pictures are bright in color and the music makes plenty of noise the buildings give plenty of shade and the neapolitan grandees ask no more my physical mood was similar to theirs everything inspiring me with a wish to be idle and to lounge about and sleep yet i was constantly saying to myself that this was wrong and striving to occupy myself and to work which i could not accomplish hence arose the querulous tone of some of the letters i wrote to you and i could only escape from such a mood by rambling over the hills where nature is so divine making every man feel grateful and cheerful i did not neglect the musicians and we had a great deal of music but i cared little in reality for their flattering encomiums fordor is hitherto the only genius artist male or female that i have seen in italy elsewhere i should probably have found a great many faults with her singing but i overlooked them all because when she sings it is real music and after such a long privation that it was most acceptable now however i am once more in old rome where life is very different there are processions daily for last week was the corpus domini and just as i left the city during the celebration of the week following the holy week i now return after the corpus christi to find them engaged in the same way it made a singular impression on me to see that the streets had in the interim assumed such an aspect of summer on all sides booths with lemons and iced water the people in light dresses the windows open and the jalousie closed you sit at the doors of coffee-houses and eat gelato in quantities the corso swarmed with equipages for people no longer walk much and though in reality i miss no dear friends or relatives yet i feel quite moved when i once more saw the piazza di spagna and the familiar names written up on the corners of the streets i shall stay here for about a week and then proceed northwards the infiorata is on thursday but it is not quite certain that it will take place because they have some apprehensions of a revolution but i hope i shall witness this ceremony i mean to take advantage of this opportunity to study the hills once more and then to set off for the north wish me a good journey for i am on the eve of departure it is a year this very day since i arrived in munich to hear of fidelio and wrote to you we have not met since then but please god we shall see each other again before another year felix rome june sixteenth eighteen thirty one dear professor it was my intention some time ago to have written you a description of the music during the holy week but my journey to naples intervened and during my stay there i was so constantly occupied in wandering among the mountains and in gazing at the sea that i had not a moment's leisure to write 
hence arose the delay for which i now beg to apologize since then i have not heard a single note worth remembering in naples the music is most inferior during the last two months therefore i have no musical reminiscences to send you save those of the holy week which however made so indelible an impression on my mind that they will be always fresh in my memory i already described to my parents the effect of the whole ceremonies and they probably sent you the letter it was fortunate that i resolved to listen to the various offices with earnest and close attention and still more so that for the very first moment i felt sensations of reverence and piety i consider such a mood indispensable for the reception of new ideas and no portion of the general effect escaped me although i took care to watch each separate detail the ceremonies commenced on wednesday at half past four o'clock with the antiphon zelus domus tue a little book containing the offices for the holy week explains the sense of the various solemnities each nocturne contains three psalms signifying that christ died for all and also symbolical of the three laws the natural the written and the evangelical the domina labia mea and the duasina judorium were not sung on this occasion when the death of our saviour and master is deplored as slain by the hands of wicked godless men the fifteen lights represent the twelve apostles and the three marys in this manner the book contains much curious information on the subject so i mean to bring it with me for you the psalms are chanted fortissimo by all the male voices of two choirs each verse is divided into two parts like a question and answer or rather classified into a and b the first chorus sings a and the second replies with b all the words with the exception of the last are sung with extreme rapidity on one note but on the last they make a short melisma which is different from the first and second verse the whole psalm with all its verses is sung on this melody or tono as they call it and i wrote down several of these toni which were employed during the three days you cannot conceive how tiresome and monotonous the effect is and how harshly and mechanically they chant through the psalms the first tonus they sang was music transcribed thus the whole of forty-two verses of the psalms are sung in precisely the same manner one half of the verse ending in g a g the other in g e g they sing with the accent of a number of men quarrelling violently and it sounds as if they were shouting at furiously one against another the closing words of each psalm are chanted more slowly and impressively a long triad being substituted for the melisma sung piano for instance this is the first music transcribed antiphon and sometimes more than one serves as an introduction to each psalm these are generally sung by two countertenor voices in canto framo in harsh hard tones the first half of each verse is in the same style and the second responded to by the chorus of male voices that i already described i have kept the several antiphons that i wrote down that you may compare them with the book on the afternoon of wednesday the sixty-eighth sixty-ninth and seventieth psalms were sung by the by this division of the verses of the psalms sung in turns by each chorus is one of the innovations that bjomsen has introduced into the evangelical church here he also ushers in each choral by an antiphon composed by georg a musician who resides here in the style of canti fermi first sung by a few voices succeeded by a choral such as ein fuste berg ist in Tilgott after the seventieth psalm comes a paternoster sub silentio that is all present and stand up and a short silent inward prayer ensues and a pause then commences the first lamentation of jeremiah sung in a low subdued tone in the key of g major a solemn and fine composition of palestrinas the solos are chanted entirely by high tenor voices swelling and subsiding alternately in the most delicate renditions sometimes floating almost inaudibly and gently blending the various harmonies being sung without any bass voices 
and immediately succeeding the previous harsh intonations of the psalms the effect is truly heavenly it is rather unfortunate however that those very parts which ought to be sung with the deepest emotion and reverence being evidently those composed with a peculiar fever should chance to be merely the titles of the chapter or verse alpha bet gimel etc and that the beautiful commencement which sounds as if it came direct from heaven should be precisely on these words intipit lamentatio jami profit lexio unas this must be not a little repulsive to every protestant heart and if there be any design to introduce a similar mode of chanting into our churches it appears to me that this will always be a stumbling block for any one who sings chapter first cannot possibly feel any pious emotions however beautiful the music may be let him strive as he will my little book indeed says vendendo profetizzato il crucifigimento con gran pieta si cantano eziandio moto lamentano volmenta alfa e le altre similia parole che sono le lettere dell'alfabeto ebreo perce e hanno in ogni canzone in luogo di lamento come è questa ciascuna lettera ha in sé tutto il sentimento di quel versetto che la segue e i come un argomento di esso but this explanation is not worth much after this the seventy first seventy second and seventy third psalms are sung in the same manner with their antiphons these are apportioned to the various voices the soprano begins in monte olivetti on which the bass voices chime in forte ora vit ad patrium pater etc then follow the lessons from the treatise of st augustine on the psalms the strange mode in which these are chanted appeared to me very extraordinary when i heard them for the first time on psalm sunday without knowing what it meant a solitary voice is heard reciting on one note not as in the psalms but very slowly and impressively making the tone ring out clearly there are different cadences employed for the different punctuation of the words to represent a comma interrogation and full stop perhaps you are already acquainted with these to me they were a novelty and appeared very singular the first for example was chanted by a powerful bass voice in g if the comma occurs he sings so on the last word music transcribed an interrogation thus music transcribed a full stop music transcribed For example, music transcribed. I cannot describe to you how strange the falling cadence from A to C sounds, especially when the bass is followed by a soprano who begins on D and makes the same falling cadence from E to G then an alto does the same in his key for they sang three different lessons alternatively with a canto fermo i send you a specimen of the mode in which they render the canto fermo regardless both of the words and the sense the phrase better he had never been born was thus sung music transcribed quite fortissimo and monotonously then came psalms seventy four seventy five and seventy six followed by three lessons succeeded by the miseria sung in the same style as the preceding psalms in the following tonas music transcribed It will be long before you can improve on this then follow the psalms eight sixty two and sixty six canticum moisi in its own tone the psalms one forty eight one forty nine and fifty came next and then antiphons during this time the lights on the altar are all extinguished save one which is placed behind the altar six wax candles still continue to burn high above the entrance 
the rest of the space is already dim and now the whole chorus unisono in tone with full strength of their voices the canti come zecaria during which the last remaining lights are extinguished the mighty swelling chorus in the gloom and the solemn vibration of so many voices have a wonderfully fine effect the melody in d minor is also very beautiful at the close all is profound darkness and antiphon begins on the sentence now he that betrayed him gave him a sign and continues to the words that same is he hold him fast then all present fall on their knees and one solitary voice softly sings christus factus es pro nobis obedien usget mortem a pause ensues which each person repeats the pattern of stir to himself during this silent prayer a death-like silence prevails in the whole church presently the miseria commences with a chord softly breathed by the voices and gradually branching off into two choirs this beginning and its first harmonious vibration certainly made the deepest impression on me for an hour and a half previously one voice alone had been heard chanting almost without any variety after the pause came an admirably constructed chord which has the finest possible effect causing every one to feel in their hearts the power of music it is this indeed that is so striking the best voices are reserved for the miseria which is sung with the greatest variety and effect the voices swelling and dying away from the softest piano to the full strength of the choir no wonder that it should excite deep emotion in every heart moreover they do not neglect the power of contrast verse after verse being chanted by all the male voices in unison forte and harshly at the beginning of the subsequent verses the lovely rich soft sounds of voices steal on the ear lasting only for a short space and succeeded by a chorus of male voices during the verses sung in monotone every one knows how beautifully the softer choir are about to uplift their voices soon they are again heard again to die away too quickly and before the thoughts can be collected the service is over on the first day when the miseria of baini was given in the key of b minor they sang thus miseria mei duas to misericordion tuam from the music with solo voices two choirs using the whole strength of voices at their command then all the bass singers commenced to di forte by f sharp chanting on the note et secudium multitudium to iniquitium miam which is immediately succeeded by a soft chord in b minor and so on to the last verse of all which they sing with their entire strength the second short silent prayer ensues when all the cardinals scrape their feet noisily on the pavement which betokens the close of the ceremony my little book says this noise is symbolical of the tumult made by the hebrews in seizing christ it may be so but it sounded exactly like the commotion in the pit of a theatre when the beginning of a play is delayed or when it is finally condemned the single taper is still burning is then brought from behind the altar and all silently dispersed by its solitary light on leaving the chapel i must not omit to mention the striking effect of the blazing chandelier lighting up the great vestibule where the cardinals and their attendant priests traverse the illuminated coronal through ranks of swiss guards the miseria sung on the first day was baini's a composition entirely devoid of life or power like all his works still it has chords and music and so it made a certain impression on the second day they gave some pieces by allegri in bai on good friday the music was all bai's as allegri composed only one verse on which the rest are chanted i heard three compositions which they gave on that day it is however quite a material which they sing for the embellimenti are pretty much the same in all three each chord has its embellimento thus very little of the original composition is to be discovered how these embellimenti have crept in they will not say it is maintained that they are traditional but this i entirely disbelieve the first place no musical tradition is to be relied on besides how is it possible to carry down a five-part movement to the present time from mere hearsay it does not sound like it it is evident that they have been more recently added and it appears to me that the director having had good high voices at his command and wishing to employ them during the holy week wrote down for their use ornamental phrases founded on the simple unadorned chords to enable them to give full scope and effect to their voices 
They certainly are not of ancient date, but are composed with infinite talent and taste, and their effect is admirable. One in particular is often repeated, and makes so deep an impression, that when it begins, an evident excitement pervades all present. Indeed, in any discussion as to the mode of executing this music, and when people say that the voices do not seem like the voices of men, but those of angels from on high, and that these sounds can never be heard anywhere else, it is this particular embellimento to which they invariably allude. For example, in the miseria, whether that of Bai or Legri, for they have recourse to the same embellimenti in both, these are the consecutive chords. Music transcribed. Instead of this, they sing it so. Music transcribed. The soprano intones the high C in a pure soft voice, allowing it to vibrate for a time, and slowly gliding down, while the alto holds the C steadily, so that at first, I was under the delusion that the high C was still held by the soprano. The skill, too, with which the harmony is gradually developed is truly admirable. The other embellimenti are adapted in the same way to the consecutive chords, but the first one is by far the most beautiful. I can give no opinion as to the particular mode of executing the music, but what I once read that some particular acoustic contrivance caused the continued vibration of the sounds is an entire fable, quite as much so as the assertion that they sing from tradition and without any fixed time, one voice simply following the other, for I saw plainly enough the shadow of Bayani's long arm moving up and down. Indeed, he sometimes struck his music desk quite audibly. There is no lack of mystery, too, on the part of the singers and others. For example, they never say beforehand what particular miseria they intend to sing, but that it will be decided at the moment, etc., etc. The key in which they sing depends on the purity of the voices. The first day it was in B minor, the second and third in E minor, but each time they finished almost in B flat minor. The chief soprano, Mariano, came from the mountains to Rome expressively to sing on this occasion, and it is to him I owe hearing the embellimenti with their highest notes. However careful and attentive the singers may be, still the negligence and bad habits of the whole previous year have their revenge. Consequently, the most fearful dissonance sometimes occurs. I must not forget to tell you that on the Thursday, when the miseria was about to begin, I clambered up a ladder, leaning against the wall, and was thus placed close to the roof of the chapel, so that I had the music, the priests, and the people far beneath me in gloom and shadow. Seated thus alone without vicinity of any obtrusive stranger, the impression made on me was very profound. But to proceed, you must have had more than enough of the miserias in these pages, and I intend to bring you more particular details, both verbal and written. On Thursday, at half-past ten o'clock, high mass was celebrated. They sang an eight-part composition of Hattini's in no way remarkable. I reserve for you some canti from me and antiphons which I wrote down at the time, and my little book describes the order of the various services and the meaning of the different ceremonies. At the Gloria in Excelsis, all the bells in Rome peal forth and are not rung again till after Good Friday. The hours are marked in the churches by wooden clappers. The words of the Gloria, the signal for all the strange tumult of bells, were chanted from the altar by an old cardinal Pacha, in feeble trembling voice. This being succeeded by the choirs and all the bells, had a striking effect. After the credo, they sang Fratus Egoinim of Palestrina, but in the most unfinished and careless manner. The washing of the pilgrims' feet followed, and a procession in which all the singers join, Baini beating the time from a large book carried before him, making signs first to one and then to another, while the singers pressed forward to look at the music, counting the time as they walked, and then chiming in. The Pope being borne aloft in his state chair, all this I have already described to my parents. In the evening there were psalms, lamentations, lessons, and the miseria again, scarcely differing from those of the previous day. One lesson was chanted by a soprano solo on a particular melody that I mean to bring home with me. It is an adagio, 
in long-drawn notes, and lasts a quarter of an hour at least. There is no pause in the music, and the melody lies very high, and yet it was executed with the most pure, clear, and even intonation. The singer did not drop his tone, so much as a single comma, the very last notes swelling and dying away, as even and full as the beginning. It was, indeed, a masterly performance. I was struck by the meaning they attached to the words, appoggiatura. If the melody goes from C to D, or from C to E, they sing thus, music transcribed. Or, or, This is what they call an appoggiatura. Whatever they may choose to designate it, the effect is most disagreeable, and it must require long habit to not be discomposed by this strange practice, which reminds me very much of our old women at home in church. Moreover, the effect is the same. I saw in my book that the tenebre was to be sung, and thinking that it would interest you to know how it was given in the papal chapel, I was on the watch with a sharp pointed pencil when it commenced and send you herewith the principal parts. It was sung very quick, and forte throughout, without exception. The beginning was music transcribed. I cannot help it, but I own it doesn't irritate me to hear such holy and touching words sung into such dull, drawing music. They say it is canto fermo, Gregorian, etc. No matter. If at that period there was neither the feeling nor the capability to write in a different style, at all events we have now the power to do so, and certainly this mechanical monotony is not to be found in the scriptural words. They are all truth and freshness, and moreover, expressed in the most simple and natural manner why then make them sound like mere formula and in truth such singing as this is nothing more the word peter with a little flourish the menum with a shake the hut qui me can this be called sacred music there is certainly no false expression in it because there is none of any kind but does this very fact prove the desecration of the words a hundred times during the ceremony I was driven wild by such things as these, and then came people in a state of ecstasy, saying how splendid it had all been. This sounded to me like a bad joke, and yet they were quite in earnest. At mass, early on Friday morning, the chapel is stripped of all its decorations, the altar uncovered, and the pope and cardinals in mourning. The Passion, from St. John, was sung, composed by Vittoria, but the words of the people in the chorus alone are his. The rest are chanted according to an established formula, but more of this hereafter. The whole appeared to me too trivial and monotonous. I was quite out of humor, and, in fact, dissatisfied with the affair altogether. One of the two following modes ought to be adopted. The Passion ought to either be recited quietly by the priest, as St. John relates it, in which case there is no occasion for the chorus to sing Crucifigium, nor for the alto to represent Pilate or else the scene should be so thoroughly realized that it ought to make me feel as if i were actually present and saw it all myself in that event pilate ought to sing just as he would have spoken the chorus shout out crucifija in a tone anything but sacred and then through the impress of entire truth and the dignity of the object represented the singing would become sacred church music i require no undercurrent of thought when i hear music which is not to me a mere medium to elevate the mind to piety as they say here 
but a distinct language speaking plainly to me for though the sense is expressed by the words it is equally contained in the music this is a case with the passion of sebastian bach but as they sing it here it is very imperfect being neither a simple narrative nor yet a grand solemn dramatic truth the chorus sings barabam to the same sacred chords as eighteen tiara pax pilate speaks exactly in the same manner as the evangelist the voice that represents our blessed saviour commences always piano in order to have one definite distinction but when the chorus breaks loose shouting at their sacred chords it seems entirely devoid of meaning pray forgive these strictures i now proceed with simple narration again the evangelist is a tenor and the mode of chanting the same as that of the lessons with a peculiar falling cadence at the comma the interrogation and full stop the evangelist intones on d and sings thus at a full stop music transcribed and a comma and at the conclusion when another personage enters so christ is represented by a bass and commences always thus i could not catch the formula though i noted down several parts which i can show to you when i return among others the words spoken on the cross all the other personages pilate peter the maid and the high priest are altos and sing this melody only music transcribed the chorus sings the words of the people from their places above while everything else is sung from the altar i must really mark down here a curiosity the crucifixion, just as i noted at the time music transcribed the program is too most singular very tame jews indeed but my letter is already too long so i shall discuss the subject no further prayers are then offered up for all nations and institutions each separately designated when the prayer for the jews is uttered no one kneels as they do at all the others nor is amen said they pray pro perfidious judaeis and the author of my book discovers an explanation of this also then follows the adoration of the cross a small crucifix is placed in the centre of the chapel and all approach barefooted without shoes fall down before it and kiss it during this time the improperia are sung i have only once heard this composition but it seems to me to be one of palestrina's finest works and they sing it with remarkable enthusiasm there is surprising delicacy and harmony in its execution by the choir they are careful to place every passage in its proper light and to render it sufficiently prominent without making it too conspicuous one chord blending softly with the other moreover the ceremony is very solemn and dignified and the most profound silence regains the chapel they sing the oft recurring greek holy in the most admirable manner each time with the same smoothness and expression you will not be a little surprised however when you see it written down for they sing it as follows music transcribed
such passages as that at the commencement, where all the voices sing the very same embellishment, repeatedly occur, and the ear becomes accustomed to them. The effect of the whole is undoubtedly superb. I only wish you could hear the tenors in the first chorus, and the mode in which they take the high A on the word Theos. The note is so long drawn and ringing, though softly breathed, that it sounds most touching. This is repeated again and again, till all in the chapel have performed the adoration of the cross. But as on this occasion the crowd was not very great, I unluckily had not the opportunity of hearing it as often as I could have wished. I quite understand why the improperias produce the strongest effect on Goethe, for they are nearly the most faultless of all, both as music and ceremonies, and everything connected with them are in the most entire harmony. A procession follows to fetch the host, which has been exposed and adored on the previous evening in another chapel of the Quirno, lighted up by many hundred wax lights. The morning service closed at half past one with a hymn in Canto Framo. At half past three in the afternoon, the first nocturne began with the psalms, lessons, etc. I corrected what I had written down heard the miseria of Beani, and about seven o'clock followed the cardinals home through the illuminated vestibule, so all was now seen, and all was now over. I was anxious, dear professor, to describe the Holy Week to you minutely, as they were memorable days to me, every hour bringing with it something interesting and long anticipated. I also particularly rejoiced in feeling that, in spite of the excitement and the numerous discussions in praise or blame, the solemnities made as vivid an impression on me as if I had been quite free from all previous prejudice or prepossession. I thus saw the truth confirmed that perfection, even in a sphere most foreign to us, leaves its own stamp on the mind. May you read this long letter with even half the pleasure I feel in recalling the period of the Holy Week at Rome. Yours faithfully, Felix Mendelssohn Bartoldi. End of section 13